Dr. Charles Davidson joins us. He's the Clinical Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern Medicine Lung Cardiovascular Institute. And uh, today we're talking about cardiovascular disease and uh, some new methods that have been employed in, in a way. Uh, this, is, this is a non, non-invasive method, I understand. Yes, it's more of a non-surgical. Non-surgical. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, February is actually Heart Health Month. Every every uh, every medical concern has its own month, obviously. So this is February. Is is this? Um, who's most likely to suffer from from heart attacks, and, and how would you know? What are the risk factors factors involved? So February with Valentine's Day is always a good time to be thinking about your heart yeah, and the rest so. of the year, hopefully yeah. as well. But uh, makes sense. So happy Valentine's Day to everybody. But um, the, the when we talk about coronary artery disease, that's where we really can identify risk factors for for blocked arteries in the heart. And some of the primary risk factors we concern ourselves with is patients that have diabetes, patients that are smokers, high blood pressure, uh, people with high cholesterol. Now, some of these risk factors can be modified by diet, exercise, and cholesterol medications or blood pressure medications. Mm-hmm. Obviously, some are not modifiable, and those are the genetic components um, that were, that you may or may not be born with. And we unfortunately or fortunately can't change our, our parents and our hereditary, but we can modify those other risk factors. And it's very important that if you have those risk factors that you're on the proper medications and, and modifying your, your diet and exercise regimens to kind of stack as much as you can the odds, odds in your favor. And if you do, then the risk of heart attacks goes down dramatically, and with that, the risk of stroke as well. It's kind of interesting to me because when you get older, you go to the doctor more frequently or at all, and your situation is, is diagnosed. And, and if you have a risk of heart disease or cholesterol problems or high blood pressure, it's treated accordingly by, by medication. It seems to be the younger people that are living without knowing what they're living with until they get into this regimen later in life. No, it's a great observation. I, I think for for many reasons, and, and some of which and, and, and in people's youth, they have some ability to feel, feel infallible and uh, don't necessarily look after some of these risk factors until it becomes more obvious that they manifest with with symptoms mm-hmm. and and people then decide to do something about it. But what we'd love to do and what we've been trying to do is get these initiatives out to younger people to realize if you have high blood pressure, let's treat it. If you have, if you're overweight, if you're smoking in particular, let's stop that very early. There's nothing good happening from that. You're 20 times more likely to have a heart problem with smoking than if you don't smoke. And it's what's interesting to me is that people that have a problem and continue to smoke afterwards. But there's things that can be done earlier, but it, it doesn't seem to get click in people's head to a little bit later in life to actually start treating this when often the disease process has already begun to manifest itself. And prevention earlier would have, would have saved any, any uh, deal that they had to have later in life. Now, uh, what is the difference between the heart valve disease and heart disease, or is it the same? So heart disease, typically, it's either valvular or coronary disease. And the number one killer in the United States is coronary disease, and that's the one that's most commonly spoken about. But really, valvular heart disease is very common in America and worldwide. And some forms of valve disease occur uh, as a congenital problem. In other words, you're born with it. But many develop as people age. And then the valves, what they do is regulate essentially blood flow in the heart. It's just like like plumbing in your house. We think of ourselves as interventional cardiologists as kind of uh, glorified plumbers, if you will, because mm-hmm. we're regulating blood flow in the heart, either through the arteries or through the valves. And the valves kind of open and close to regulate that blood flow throughout the body. And at times they can become diseased when then they either leak too much, that means blood supposed to be going forward is going backward, that's called regurgitation, or they're blocked up when blood can't go forward, and that's called stenosis. We now have treatments for those that don't require open-heart surgery, where in the past, severe forms of those diseases were only treated by open-heart surgery because medicines are often ineffective when it becomes severe. Wow. Is is open-heart surgery the same as bypass surgery? 
So the bypass surgery would be open heart surgery for artery blockages, and then valve replacement or valve repair would be open heart surgery for okay. valvular disease. And, and as I said, with, with valve disease, particularly aortic valve disease is one we should talk about because there's been really a revolution in the last five, ten years in aortic valve disease where people with blocked aortic valves called aortic stenosis, blood couldn't exit the heart. And we know when that occurs, there's about a 50% chance of dying within two years, and medications don't affect that. And so the only treatment <clears throat> that was available, excuse me, was open heart surgery, and now Right. Uh, we have ways of putting new valves in through a leg artery, and patients are up and around the same day and often home in a day or two. Really? And the results seem to be better than, than surgery in, in various populations of patients. And uh, this has really helped to extend the life of people and, and improve their quality of life. Wow. Oh, that's a big wow. That is a big problem. It, it's it been huge, true. I'm telling you, for these people. A lot of them didn't have surgical options because they were they maybe t were too old at the time to undergo surgery. And so yeah. they were really faced with a, with a diagnosis that was going to limit their life. I had a woman I did nine years ago. was one of our very first. And now she's 110 years old and as sharp and bright as can be. And so wow. as the population ages, people are developing valve disease. And, and now we have ways of extending their life and letting them enjoy their great grandchildren and grandchildren. And we're extending it now down to younger patients because the results have been so good with the, with the elderly where we first started out. Yeah. See, that's the scary part is with heart disease and other things. Uh, when you need major operations when you're elderly, uh, you know, you, you keep your fingers crossed uh, because they're major operations and the recuperation and the uh, infection and that kind of thing. So it's just it's miraculous that, I mean, that just changes everything, especially for the elderly. It's been a game changer. And, and you know what we're seeing now, and I see a lot in the hospitals, Patients now that develop valve disease in their 50s and 60s, you know, they've read about the treatments that are non-surgical, and they're coming in and saying, you know, I really don't want to go through surgery if I can get similar results. And with aortic valve disease, we've been able to achieve that. And now we're moving into the other valves with mitral valve disease and tricuspid valve disease. Typically, we start out with the, the high-risk patients, as you alluded to, people that may have other comorbidities or are older, and surgery wouldn't be the best option. But as the results become more durable and, and more predictable, we've been able to migrate that uh, slowly into, a, into the uh, more general population. Good stuff. I'm glad we had this talk uh, because the more that the public uh, is educated, the more uh, they can you manage their own bodies, and, and I, I've always said on this show, second opinions are, are the hilt where one doctor may know something and the other doctor doesn't know. And let me ask you a quick question. It has little to do with it or actually a lot. When you go for a second opinion on something major or how to treat something major, does the, does the second doctor require to see the first doctor's assessment, or can you go in blind with the second doctor so that they can't be swayed with their opinion? That's an excellent question, and I, I encourage patients to do it whatever, whatever way they feel best about. I, I would say that if you've had testing done by another physician, rather than having all that testing repeated, it's I very see. helpful gotcha. to receive gotcha. the images and the results of the test so that you can review those without necessarily going back on it. But I think a doctor that offers a lot of second opinions, good at second opinions, is going to give you an independent evaluation regardless of whether they receive the records or not. Um, I agree, agree with you wholeheartedly that second opinions are critical. There are lots of choices now that weren't available even a few years ago, and not all of those are even known by our medical community. So when patients get diagnosed with heart disease, seek a second opinion. Uh, get more information. Go online. Be, a, be an educated consumer for your health. Um, those, are, to me, are the best patients, and hopefully that's the way you receive the best outcomes. Great. If anybody has any concerns or questions along these lines, uh, where would they go to, to get them answered? Uh, we have a nice website. It's heart.nm, northwesternmedicine.org. Uh, there's patient stories. There's all of the new devices that we have and trials available on there. Uh, there's some education about different disease states and treatments, and uh, I think patients will, will hopefully find that a nice educational piece. Dr. Davidson, you've been a wealth of information. This has been pretty good, and I appreciate it, and uh, the best to you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. It's my pleasure to speak with you today.